the largest questions I get about CMAs is not just how to do them, but having the confidence in the number that you come up with. Right. So we do it, but then we maybe like second guess ourselves. Like, did I do it right? Is that the right price? Like, do I go to them with that price? I don't know. What if I screwed it up? And then you kind of second guess yourself and you're just not, you don't have that like confidence about what it is that you're talking about. Right. You got to have the confidence about your CMAs if you're going to be able to land the listing. And landing listings is uber important because you can run yourself around ragged with buyers over and over every single day. But if you get a listing, that is how you will like blossom your business. You get a listing, you're advertising, your signs in the ground, people see your name, you get phone calls on the sign, you can pick up new buyers off of that listing. Even if they don't want to buy the one that you have to sell, you can pick up more clients that way. So when we talk about lead generation, you know, and we, we pay for leads and we have all these other options, get your freaking sign in the ground. Even if you get your sign on the ground with a for sale by owner and you are charging them less money, I don't care. Get your sign in the ground because people need to see that. And you can get business off of that. Then you can do your own open houses. Like it is a platform, okay? Listings are a platform. So if you're not focusing on listings, I would shift your mindset a little bit. If you're scared of listings, I've had people say that to me before, get over it. That gets part of your job. And here's the other way that it multiplies your business. I got a really weird hair here. Okay, so the other way it multiplies your business is that person selling the house inevitably has to buy something. So I was, I was looking at my board yesterday and it's like, how do you get to such high numbers? Well, this guy's selling and buying, this guy's selling and buying, this guy's selling and buying. So you have one client and you've got two transactions, right? You're multiplying your money like that. Whereas if you only have a buyer, you've got the one transaction if they don't have something to sell, okay? So you need the listings. It is uh, super important. Okay, so when we're doing a market analysis, uh, I believe that was module 11. If you haven't gone through it recently and you're you know, worried about it, go through it again. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit on a few specific points. So it's really easy to do a market analysis if you are analyzing a three-bedroom, two-bathroom home that's 1,300 square feet next to five blocks of other three-bedroom, two-bathroom homes that are 1,300 square feet, right? Can I get an amen on that one? Super easy. What happens? So my sister calls me from Texas, and she said, okay, I have a shot at this you know, 800 to a million dollar house. She wasn't exactly sure what the price was, but she knew it was, you know, it was definitely up there out of her realm, right? She's only been one year in business and she's like, ah, freaking out. What do I do? How do I comp a property of that size, of that price, of that caliber? Not to mention it was on the outskirts. So it was on six acres. So she's used to these subdivision homes. And then all of a sudden she gets this anomaly that is on six acres. It has a giant shop that's finished, has a bathroom, like it's bougie. And she's like, what do I do? Okay, so then she tried to go pull comps. Guess what she couldn't find? Properties on six acres. Nothing had been selling. She found a lot of things on two acres, but nothing on six acres. So here's the breakdown of when you have a property, then this is gonna apply to any property that is not normal, right? That's not your cookie cutter. Um, this is a perspective on how to look at it to break down and have more of an opinion of the property than just really focusing on those like hard numbers of a CMA. Okay. This is like, we're drawing conclusions. This is common sense that, that we're working the common sense aspect. We're not working the, sorry, if you're an accountant type person, this is not the accountant type way. Okay. So, um, so first thing is we're going to look at the area. Okay. When you are looking at a property, you need to be fluent in the area. You need to understand what goes on in the area, what kind of properties sell in the area, what kind of prices they're selling for. So I would pull up anything. Let's say if there's not a lot, first, I would start with the last six months. What's in this area? in the last six months that's sold. Just blanket, right? Just blanket. Like you can do a radius search 
So you can go, here's the, here's the property and I'm gonna go like three mile radius or a two mile radius. It depends on how dense it is, of course, but do a radius search and just find out, okay, here's the area. What sold in the last six months? Now let's say there's not a lot of turnover. So not a lot of sold in the last six months, then what? Okay, then you're going to go back 12 months. You wanna know, why are we going back 12 months? We're going back 12 months because you wanna know what the demand is for the area. If there is not a lot of turnover in that area, it may be a high demand area, right? And then if property comes up for sale and somebody loves that area, they're gonna be on it like blue on it, right? So that is very important to know what is our demand because when we're choosing a price, that helps us to understand how far can we push the price. If there's a ton of turnover in the area and things sit on the market for a really long time, then we know we probably can't push the price real high. We're gonna to have to be a little bit more competitive as opposed to, okay, there's not very much on the, like three things have sold in the last 12 months in this three mile radius on these acreage properties. If that's the case and you have this bougie house, then we can be able to list you on the high end, push the price 100%, right? You have to understand what's going on in the area, okay? Um, Jackie's asking, how do you comp a home subdivision in the middle of a mobile home park? Okay, I'll get to that in a minute. Good question. Um, okay, so we wanna know what's going on in the area. Um, the next thing is we wanna look up, so this is our triple threat, right? Okay, that's our first thing. Okay, we wanna look up similar homes. Now, when I say similar homes, I'm just talking square footage. Just focus on the square footage. Now, if you've got, now let's talk acreage properties in case you have those in your area, okay? So like this one was six acres and all she could find was things that were like one to two acre properties. That's fine. You can go down here. Now, I wouldn't go below an acre at all. If you get down to like a half an acre, that's a little bit more of a different ball game. You gotta be an acre or over if you're up in the six. Now you can go, here's the span. Here's the difference, you guys. If you have a six acre property, I'm gonna go one to 15 acres. That's, I'm gonna, that's, that's gonna be my search. Very broad, right? But you can adjust off acres very easily. You can adjust the home site a lot easier than you can adjust for the square footage. Now, let me explain why. Um, the reason why we don't have, why we don't use comparables that are so drastically different in square footage is because when we're adjusting off our square, so you say you're $50 a square foot, that's a pretty average, um, price per square foot adjustment that we get from our appraisers on new construction or remodeled homes. We're about 50 bucks a square foot. Well, if you're a thousand square feet different, right? That is a drastic adjustment in price and it becomes inaccurate. It becomes inaccurate. So you can't adjust that much. You wanna stay like 500 square feet is probably like a max amount that you wanna be in. If you look at something that says a thousand square feet different, you're probably not gonna use it as a comp necessarily um, for supporting documentation, but you can look at it and go, okay, they were willing to pay X amount of dollars for this house. This is what we are. Like, where are we gonna fit in that puzzle, right? It's always the, am I better, am I worse? Like, okay, they have this that's better. I have this that's better. Like what, if I'm gonna go shopping, what is, what would I buy? Like, would, would that be worth it to me? Put some opinion in it. Like, would I pay that amount? Heck no, they're charging way too much. Or yeah, that's a pretty dang good deal because they have X, Y, and Z. Like, you know, they have the bougie shop, they have a pool, they have all the upgrades. Like, so even though they have less square footage, like it's worth it, right? So a little bit of common sense around that number. And again, we're not coming to an exact number yet, this is just, you have to be able to understand what's going on in the market and then understand what's going on with the competition as well, right? Okay, the next thing that we're gonna look at is the price range. We 
we wanna pull up from what we've now looked at for the area and some similar homes with kind of similar land, we're going to look up the price range. So, okay, everything seems to be selling in the, and I'll just use that Texas one as an example, right? Everything seems to be selling in that area. Things without a shop were like 800,000. No one had a shop. So that was kind of through it for a loop. And then there were some things that were in the like $1.8 million range, okay? So she had a pretty big range. And then it's trying to figure out where you fall within that range. So you wanna see two things. What happened in that price range in the last six to 12 months? How fast the properties move? Get a clear picture. Okay, what, what was going on, what it looks like. For any, and this, you guys, when we're talking about this, this will help you get outside your box. If you get approached about a house that's in a price range you've never done before, like Colleen had this with her $890,000 house and she's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, it's a $900,000 house. Is it really worth $900,000? You know, it's hard to wrap your head around those prices when you haven't been in that price range yet. So this helps you to familiar, familiarize yourself with the price range and what happens. And what do the other listings look like? Like what, what's their presentation like? Why do you think that they sold one sold faster than another one? Like this is the type of research that you need to be able to do and understand because we are going to be imparting this information onto our client. So instead of just taking them a 32 page packet of CMA information that says, yep, yeah, here's the adjustments and here's the data and here's this, how much more powerful is it if you show up and you're like, this is what went on in the last six to 12 months in your area. These are the properties that sold. This is the price range that things were selling in. And this is how many days on market we were at. Do you need to put that on a piece of paper for people? Not really, you don't. You can, but right, coming out of your mouth is so much more powerful than just emailing them a CMA, right? Like 50 times more powerful, 50 times more powerful. So we wanna know what went on the price range and that will help you pin your price believe it or not, without all the little minute adjustments of everything, if you can see what happened in that price range and where you fit into that puzzle, that's going to help you pick your price. And especially in today's market, when demand is so, weighs so heavily on our sales, it's not just about exact, you know, exact adjustments that an appraiser would make on garages and square footage and yada, yada. It is like, what is selling? How fast is it selling? And how, how much can I get someone to pay for this property? Full on. And then, then at that time, I'm not completely irresponsible, you guys. So, Okay. You still got to have some comps. Okay. Then you go pick your comps. After you've been through the other three steps, go pick your comps. So then you can get to the, and, and you never pull comps by price. You always have to pull comps by your square footage, your land size your bedrooms, bathrooms, right? Be a little bit broad on either side of, of those areas and you can always narrow it down. If there's a lot of homes in that price range and say you're like a 2000 square foot house, then you know going anywhere from 1800 to 2200, you still may have to narrow that down and get a little bit closer be like 1900 to 2100. It just depends on how many you have in that area. Start a little bit broad. If you have too many results that come up, narrow it back down. 
and then narrow it back down again, and then take a look at what you've got. And here's where it provides confidence to you. You just did all this research and you came up with a pretty good idea about what you think that property should be worth, right? Now, when you go look for comps and you narrow those prices down and then you see what comes up and what the price range, like what the prices are what, of the comps that they sold for, is does that fall within what you just researched? Like you had an idea, now go prove your idea. It's like that whole theory, prove the theory, right? You came up with the theory, now go prove your theory. Then you ask the client what their theory was. So don't, um, don't muddy the waters by asking your client up front how much they want to sell their house for. It's like a game. So I will tell my client, I just put up that $1.3 million house. And I was like, don't tell me. Because she's like, well, we have an idea of what we think we want for it. I said, great, don't tell me. I don't want to know. I will ask you after. Let me do some research. So same thing, you guys. This property is an hour and a half away from me in a completely different city. It is off grid, middle of nowhere, 63 acres, like totally not much out there that's gonna compare, right? So I said, just hold, hang tight. Let me do some research. Went and did this exact same thing. Then I pulled comps. And again, when you get up into the higher price ranges, they are all over the board. You can't, it like, it will blow your mind because you can't, um, <clears throat> especially in that like two, three million, depends on what level your, your area is at, you know, two, $3 million price range. You can't compare these houses. They are so individual that none of them are alike. And then you're like, well, what the heck? How am I supposed to, I can't make adjustments off this, right? Like they're all over the board. So I came up with, I told her like 1.3. I said, I really think we could probably push 1.3 on your property. And she goes, I said, and, and here's the other thing you have to look at. What are they selling for? Like, what's the reduction in price that you're seeing? Are they reducing in price or are they selling over, over what people are listing for? Because if I tell her you're going to list at 1.3, but every other comparable out there that was in that price range they all sold for fifty to $100,000 less than what they listed for. So what does that tell me? That I probably need to warn my client or educate them, set the expectation that it's a dang good possibility that if we put you up at 1.3, we're going to probably sell at the 1.25 to 1.2. And then I said, where did you want to sell your house at? Like, what did you want out of it? What was your thought? And she said, smack dab in the middle. We thought 1.25. And I was like, perfect. Great. Right. And that's where we hit. Interestingly enough, the client pretty much just did the same research. I just had a little bit more information than she did, but she was looking around at the neighboring properties. She was watching Zillow to see what was on the market, what was off the market. She was drawing her own conclusions. I didn't want to tell her that, but that's what she was doing. She was doing what I do. I just had to go in and find the exact information to actually back up the claims, right? Then you can have confidence. Then you can say it with confidence. Then you can land the listings. That's it. You get one person, imagine, one person that comes in and hands over the packet of papers and say, I can list your house for you know, 1.3 million. And you get the second person that comes in and said, you know, here's the information. This is what goes on in the market. This is what things sell for. This is how long they're on the market. This is what we can expect. This is how far I can push your price. What do you think? This is what I can provide to you on a listing. I can provide, you know, amazing photos, some drone footage. Like, you know, you go through description, you know, for days. That's just amazing. That really will draw people in. Like, this is what I can provide, you know, provide as a listing agent. Here's your, here's your fancy packet. Here's your person that says they know what they're doing. Like your salesperson, you have to sell yourself. We're not just sticking a sign on the ground. Okay, I'm gonna go through and answer a couple questions here. 
Am I, I'm a yeller. I'm a teacher yeller. Am I get fired up? By Saturday night, you guys, I started feeling better. I freaking, I packaged, I was up till two o'clock in the morning. I packaged like a hundred planners. I was like, clean my office. I was like, okay, I'm better. Like I'm good. I'm watch out people. I'm coming. Okay. Jackie said, how do you comp a home or a sub in a subdivision that's in the middle of a mobile home park? So Jackie, you might have to clarify. Um, if you're talking about area, so if you have, let's say, oh, can you unmute? Okay. Yes. Yes. Go for it. Okay. So I guess what I'm meaning is, is that there's a subdivision and it's surrounded by um, mobile home parks. Okay. So, so do I have to go out more miles or farther out to comp the homes that are in the center of that? Or, I mean, I don't, I don't know how. Are you concerned? Are you concerned that the fact that there's mobile home around the subdivision is decreasing the value of the homes in the subdivision? Yes. Okay. So that is where you need to do the research and go back, whether it's one year or two years in the MLS, find mm -hmm. out if that is a fact. Okay. So we can have an opinion about that and we can think that it might, and that is a good, that is a good thought that you do need to pay attention to, but you need to go check to see if that is truth. And what I would do is see what the, um, look first in that specific subdivision and see what the history is. Okay. What you're looking at, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then for the same time period, whether it's six months or, you know, it depends on what the turnover is in the area, it could be 30 days. But um, for that same time period, look at a neighboring subdivision, probably your closest one that you could find that's similar age and see what those prices are. And are you seeing price differences between the two areas? Okay. Then if you don't have very many homes to use as comparables in that subdivision, but you know that there is a location kind of adjustment that's going to have to be made for the demand, mm -hmm. then you can be able to know what that adjustment really is. Is it, it's almost like the difference. Think about it like this. It's almost like the difference between a manufactured home and a still stick built home. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, there's usually a discrepancy between what someone will pay and what the value is of a stick built home as compared to a manufactured home. Okay. And usually for us, it would run around $50,000. That's just kind of an average. So check out to see if there's a discrepancy or not. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Go get him, Jackie. Go get him. Okay. <laughs> Um, Colleen said she added someone to a search yesterday for her city, three bedroom, two bath, two car garage, 1,500 to 2,500 square feet, no price because they wanted to see everything. Everything equals five houses. <laughs> yes. So tides will change. Hang in there. Um, if you have a low inventory, you guys, it's still, it will change. So the good agents will just keep hanging in there and wade through whatever is going on at the moment. Because, you know, sometimes it's low inventory, like we're gonna complain about that, but then sometimes it's gonna be too high of inventory and we can't move it, we can't move a house. Nobody wants to buy and we've got too many things to sell. So there's always something that's going to be wrong. We just have to identify, and not wrong, but you know, the challenge in the industry at the moment, we just have to decide what that is and then how do we combat it or what angle do we use to capitalize on that for ourselves, right? Um, Steve said, with all the market information, how do you come up with a number if it has a fancy outbuilding? Three extra acres versus the rest of the properties with two, within the two miles. How do you put a figure on one of one off variables? Good question. Okay, <coughs> that was the same question my sister had. How do I adjust for that? You can do it a couple different ways. Okay, so for acreage, I will tell you um, the difference. So what she got stuck on was trying to find exacts, right? An exact or super, you know, close to square footage house with very similar acreage. And she's like, I can't find it. And I said, great, look lower or look higher because with acreage or land size in general, that is an easy thing to make, adjust, to make an adjustment for. 
it's kind of like the vanilla of adjustments, right? It's excess acreage. That's what it's called. So your difference between two acres and six acres for appraisers in our area, they will adjust about $3,000 per acre. That is, the, that is the difference in acreage. So some of the comps that I had for my 63 acre property, there were no other 63 acre properties out there. The comps were like 20 acres or 40 acres. So I could find similar homes, similar square footage, and then I will adjust $3,000 per acre for the excess acreage that my property has, okay? And then add that number directly to your value. Now, so for her instance, right, she only had four acres difference, so she's an extra $12,000. Yeah, because I can count. Okay, um, now when it comes to the outbuildings, you can do this two different ways. You can go look for properties that aren't, okay, so we're not going to look, we're not going to pay attention to the house. Now we're going to pay attention to the outbuildings because we want to quantify what an outbuilding is worth. Right. So here's a property that sold with no outbuilding. Those are here's a property that sold with an outbuilding. And what was the difference kind of in those two prices? If that's the case in your research, you're going to go look for properties, even if they're on an acre, even if they're on 50 acres. What is the difference between an outbuilding, a house with an outbuilding, and a house with no outbuilding? Okay. Where it got more complicated, another layer is so you go look at that. But then the next layer is she had a bougie outbuilding, like a nice finished outbuilding with the bathroom and the heat and the tape textured painted like it was a nice, huge outbuilding. So the other way that you can approach that is by value. What would it cost to build that outbuilding? Right. This is where you love your contacts that you have your contractors, some of you can, can, anybody who's built anything recently, and you said, hey, we have this, I think it was like a 40 by 50 or 40 by 60 outbuilding. Like, what would it cost to build a 40 by 60 outbuilding, right? And take some notes if you ask that question to a builder at any time so that you have an idea about that value. I'm gonna tell you, I just built one. And it cost me, well, cost, right? Like if it cost me $200,000, but yet if you paid somebody to do it and this one's bigger and bougier, like you're probably gonna be in that two fifty, dollars $300,000 range. Again, that's prices in my area, not in hers. What's the construction cost in her area? What are they charging per square foot to build an outbuilding? The other thing that you can do, use your resources, call an appraiser. If you have an appraiser you ever have, talk to, if you have a contact for an appraiser, you guys keep those phone numbers. When you have a listing and an appraiser calls you to schedule um, to schedule the appraisal, you put them in your phone. You put their name dash appraiser. So you know that they're an appraiser, number one. Number two, you can call them and say, hey, I just have a quick adjustment question for you. I have a 30 by or 40 by 60 out building that's completely finished, super nice. How would I adjust for that? See what they say. Right. And I would say, so by the time she was done, she went in comparing homes that were in the $800,000 range. And I want to say that they, I think they ended up at like a 1.2, if I'm remembering right. She was either ending up at like a 1.2 or a 1.3 um, is where they were at. So the one thing about, um, the one thing about adjustments on outbuildings, let me tell you this. Detached garages, anything, right? It costs more to build them than you will get credit for. So if it costs me $200,000 to build a building, I generally can't do an exact $200,000 adjustment on, um, on an appraisal. They don't give you the same value. So I, I saw this a lot with smaller outbuildings when it would cost about $80,000 to build them. And the appraiser would give us like a thirty to fifty thousand dollar adjustment. It is not dollar for dollar when it comes to the outbuildings. Wish it was, but especially with the building cost being so high, you can spend a whole lot more 
then, then you can get back in value. That's again where some of that common sense shopping um, perspective comes from as well. It's like, well, yeah, maybe they won't adjust this $400,000 for this building, but some dude is going to love that building. Do I think I can get someone to pay that much money for it? Probably so. Is it in high demand? Heck yeah. Does every dude want to shop? Yep, every dude wants a shop, right? And so you can be able to use that and say, well, you know, the market may bear that. Like we could probably get somebody to buy that. And looking at it from that perspective. Um, Steve, does that kind of answer that question? It does, yeah. Um, I just never talk to uh, appraisers at all. Yeah. So just save a couple, I guess, and just get an idea. Cause it's, it's, that's kind of just the thing we run into is like a bathroom is 10,000, a uh, bedroom is 15,000. It's like, how do you, right. I was in that same boat as your sister. It's like, you want to get it pretty firm. Like yeah. This, this, but, but you yeah, can't. where the heck do you get that info? Yeah. Yeah. But you kind of can't. And, and you'd be surprised if you kind of let loose just a little bit, you'd be surprised how close you'll actually get and you'll still make a you'll still make appraisal coming from a little bit more of a loose I call it a loose perspective but you know that drawing conclusion and just proving proving your data point um, you'll you'll get there just as well but you'll have more confidence in it and it's a little less tedious it's a little more fun the other thing about it is you guys when you when you do a CMA this way you also start to become so much more of an expert in pricing and in your area. So you can much more easily, you'll get faster at it, you'll get better at it. So it's, it's a whole lot easier for you when somebody asks you for a price on their house, it's gonna be so much easier for you to be like, oh yeah, you're gonna be in this range. And then you go solidify the range, but you're gonna already have an idea. Um, it's, it's like teaching you to think instead of just teaching you to do the act. Does that make sense? Like, and agents don't really think about it. Like the common sense is removed because we get so focused on the CMA, you know, the cloud CMAs and the adjusting and the adding the comparables in and all that, that nobody's paying attention to the common sense part of it where it's like, yeah, you can do this. Like, and it's, it's, Spring. It's really amazing. Um, it's amazing to be able to, to do that. So one thing too, just to add on to that real quick is just like you said, just have that data show that, right? Just don't overthink it. I'm doing the same thing. I'm being a complete hypocrite. You overthink it. But again, you're kind of seriously, you just call yourself out. You're overthinking it. But then again, you bring that data there. You show them that. You talk through it with them. And yep. if they do interview another agent and the other agent is just coming in and just throwing out numbers, that's it and not showing right then you're you're substantiating things you're just you, you develop that connection that rapport in my opinion plus you touched on the fact too it's like well this was this price this was this price you're kind of setting them up for maybe a, a price reduction in the future yes um which is huge so they're seeing that it's not it's not a surprise so yeah good info. yeah always front loading too with those expectations you guys with your sellers will save you like so much heartache and stress and losing listings that to have those conversations up front with like, yep, we'd love to, try, let's try it this way. We think we can do this worst case scenario. We're probably here. Like always giving that information. Agents don't do this. They don't. I mean, I we're in an industry where they, they don't, they have fancy packets. We're all, you know, everybody's looking for a fancy, fancy packet. Like, I'm sorry, you guys, I'm not going to give you a template for a fancy packet. It's just not going to come from me. You can find it on Etsy, but I will give you the information to be able to actually like learn. <clears throat> and this is really, you guys, when you become better at this, this also helps add to your reputation when you are providing so much more value to your clients because clients are not used to this. 100%. They can go through 10 other agents and they will not, they will not get that same value. They won't. It's not taught. They don't do it. Right. So yeah, don't, don't get too hung up on the fancy. Get smart. Does anybody else have any questions about CMAs or things that stump you or 
Anything that we just talked about? No? No, it's just great. Yeah, go ahead, Lakeisha. Um, it's not about uh, CMAs though, but That's I okay. have strange call yesterday and I'm, I'm always confused by some of these questions I get sometimes, but um, a lady reached out to me and she said, hey, um, I have a cousin. She's already in the house, but the person, I think it was her brother or something that purchased the house, mm -hmm. but it's in his name. I don't know what they worked out. I don't know if she's paying him rent or whatever. Anyway, the brother wants to name out the house out of his name. Okay. And so she reached out and said, hey, could you help her with getting financing or something? I said, well, I got a couple of great lenders that I could send her to, you know, if she's interested. So I did all that and the lender, you know, he just keeps, uh, I, mean, I love him anyway, but he just keeps texting me and say, hey, I'm a, we're talking today and I'll let you know. And I'm sitting here like, well, I don't know what my role is in this, if this goes through. So what, right. what, how does that work? <laughs> okay. So here, so here goes, that's a really great, um, that's a really great question and an example. Um, this, this actually speaks to added value when you're not getting paid. Okay, so think forward. This is the forward thinking. Right now, there's nothing that you're getting paid for. Like 100%, she's refinancing a house. She's buying it from her brother. It's not even like a tenant buying it from some other random person. Like you really don't even need to do any paperwork at all. Okay, right? I'm just making sure, thank you. Yes. <laughs> So, so what half is from here? What I, yeah, so what I usually, but let me tell you where you can capitalize on this later, okay? This is, this is the building a business part. So right now you're going to guide and direct her to how to refinance so that she can be able to purchase it. If they need a purchase contract, your title company probably has a for sale by owner like contract that they use. So you can hook her up with the title company like you give her the resources to accomplish what she needs to accomplish. You don't have to do the work, but you're knowledgeable and you have the resources. Okay. Who's she going to call when it's time to sell the house one day? Yeah. The person that helped her that did not get paid for helping her. That was kind enough to impart the information without the expectation of money. 100%. Right. So the, Look for opportunities to serve that aren't always attached to paychecks. The other cool thing is put her on HomeBot, right? She's a seller and add her to your mailing list. That's so she didn't like buy, you didn't get paid, but put her on HomeBot, add her to your mailing list. She's going to hear from you three times, a, three times a year. If you're doing it right, guys, three times a year for your mailing list. And once a month for HomeBot, she can't forget you and she won't forget how you made her feel. Just right? let Steve know I did get HomeBot. <laughs> Good job. I know Steve's our proponent for HomeBot. I'm telling you. You know, funny, <laughs> funny thing. Um, Inman, okay, I had not heard of Inman. I don't get out much apparently, um, but it's like realtor news, big old whatever. They called me for an interview the other day. And I was reading one of their articles and it talked about the top, it was like the top 22 um, like tools for real estate this year. Guess what number one was? It was HomeBot. Yeah, we've been preaching that thing for a year, right? Just took everybody else a while to catch up. Um, okay. Oh, I can't type as fast as Lisa talks. I may be talking. Um, Oh, brokerage page you for to get into Inman. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I hadn't, I, I hadn't been reading that, but, um, but yeah, so look for opportunities. Um, I had one of my, uh, my personal agents yesterday said to me, okay, I have a client looking for a piece of property and they found this commercial piece that they're interested in. It's not listed. He contacts the person that owns it, <coughs> talks to him and the guy He's just kind of arrogant, whatever, right? He's a developer, has lots of money, uh, talks about that property. And he said, well, if I sell that property, I'm going to have to 1031 that money into some other investment. So it's a possibility, right? And so he says to my agent, 
So if you want to, if you want to see if there's other properties for me to 1030 my, you know, 1031 my money into, that'd be great. Then maybe I'd do it. Love my agent, but this is what he said. Why would I do that work for him? And I was thinking, why would you not? Right? So that is an opportunity. He took it as a task. Like the way that he looked at it was a task, like a waste of time task. But that's an opportunity for you to shine and to show this guy what you can do. Now, does the guy like probably have an agent or he's used an agent in the past? Probably, but guess what? Maybe his agent didn't perform as well as you do. So take the opportunity, kick some butt, right? Provide the information, find some good investments, do the research and try to find this guy some properties that would be good investments. It's never lost on you because you're learning. If that guy chose not to buy anything and that deal fell apart and you just did all that work, you're going to get some people, none of you, because you're all awesome. You get some people who will lament and be like, oh my gosh, I wasted so much time and complain. But it is never wasted time. You go show a person 50 houses, you didn't waste any time. You now know what all those 50 houses look like. So if you get a phone call from somebody who's interested in a property that maybe meets one of those criteria, you know what it is and you've been through it before, right? None of what we do is wasted time unless you're on TikTok all day long, then you're wasting your time, okay? But all the research that we do, looking at property, all of that, you guys, that makes you a better agent. It does. So find people that want to look at stuff. And if they want to look at stuff for fun and you have nothing to do, go look at stuff for fun. It's an education, right? Continue to educate yourself. Angie mentioned this was great. Goes back to the confidence boost for me. That was actually one thing. So I was thinking about um, what to teach you guys. Had to think a little longer and harder. That's why you didn't find out until last night. And you know, confidence is one of those things. Like we have to be confident in what it, what it is that we're doing, right? Um, and how do we get to that confidence level? Like how do we, you can't just be like, I'm confident. Like you don't just randomly become confident. But the cool thing in this job is, this is how you become confident is you can research. It costs nothing. It costs you some time. But your level of confidence in what you do grows every single time you continue to do research, every time, because you'll feel confident in knowing what you're saying, right? Um, okay, I promise I'll stop talking after one more story. I'm, co I'm coaching a broker that's in my area, okay? I love her, that's why I told her I'd coach her. And uh, anyway, found out she used to play D1 basketball in Australia. I'm like, how freaking cool is that? I never knew. Anyway, my child, who's playing varsity basketball, she needs help with her shot. And I was like, oh, like, could you coach my child? Because I, she needs some help with her shot. She's like, yeah, if you keep coaching me, I'll coach her. Okay, that, that works. Anyway, so it was so interesting. So she comes to me when we've been coaching where it's some of that confidence. Like she knows she's good, but she really can't explain why she's good or how she's good. Just a little bit of that barrier of, I know I can do it, but how do you communicate that to somebody else to be like, I'm awesome. I know I'm awesome. How do I tell you I'm awesome? Right? Like, how do we, how do we pitch ourselves that way? Because I know I'm awesome. Right? Say that all day long, you guys, you know, you're awesome. So how does she communicate that? It was so cool to see her on the court with my child because she knows freaking everything about basketball. She's like, you can do this, 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 like, just like I'm telling you now. Right. I mean, she's just all over telling her all these things. And she's so confident in what she's saying. And I was like, light bulb. It's like, she knows because she did it. Number one, she continues to work at it. Number two, and she does, she does that research. It's not because she woke up one day and she just magically could, you know, teach basketball, right? Just like we don't magically wake up and we can just sell houses because it's so easy. Like there is all that work that you do have to put into it to be good at it, to be good at it. And 
I think this industry, it's so easy to get a license, but then it's so hard to sell. And it is like, and I, and I'm right there with you. When I got my license, I was like, I'm going to sell houses, miss a house. And then I was like, I, I was like that kid getting married, right? Like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm getting married and it's so fun. It's going to be so easy, right? Sunshine and roses. And you don't know what you don't know. And it's work. But when you, when you do this kind of research and stuff, you guys, I'm kind of a geek about it. Um, but it makes it a little bit more fun because it's a, it's a game. It's a price game. So anyway, you had your best friend go with you last week and I said, I want to look at a property right with me. You can be my pretend client. That's an awesome idea. It's fun. Yeah. So get out there and get it, you guys. You're all awesome. So have that figure out for you how you deliver that confidence to your client. Like, how are you going to communicate that to your client. You figure that out. And that will help you immensely.